Hello, I'm Sandra Maxson, a member of the board of the Victoria Festival of Authors. Welcome to Writing in a Time of Slow Disaster, featuring authors Jenna Butler, Jessica Johns, Shana Lambert, and Joanna Lilly. I want to start by acknowledging that although this is a virtual event with authors and audiences joining us from across Canada, Victoria Festival of Authors is located on the traditional ancestral territories of the Lekongwen people, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations. We acknowledge these land ancestors, hereditary leaders and matriarchs, as well as the creators from these lands and give thanks to the privilege of living and working here. We are committed to serving as learners and listeners. A thank you to our sponsors, the BC Arts Council, Canada Council of the Arts, the City of Victoria, the CRD, the Government of BC, the United Way of Greater Victoria, Monroe's Books, and the League of Canadian Poets. This event and all VFA events offers closed captioning. Please click the double C at the bottom of your screen to view captions. I also wanted to let you know that you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen if you have questions for us or for the authors during the events. The moderator will be able to get to some of these questions near the end of the panel. Tonight's panel is moderated by, by Verena Kemenirts. Verena graduated with a BFA from Emily Carr University in 2002 and received a Master of Science in Biological Arts in 2008 from the University of Western Australia. In her artistic practice, she explores biogenetic research in a contemporary philosophical context. Her work has been exhibited within Canada and internationally. Currently, she works as an instructor in the Visual Arts Department at UVic and has facilitated workshops exploring the intersection of visual arts and scientific research and documentation. Please welcome Marina. Hello, good evening. Welcome to our panel, Writing in the Time of Slow Disaster. I would like to start by acknowledging that I'm a visitor on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, now known as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. We are lucky to have four wonderful authors joining us from afar this evening, Jenna Butler, Jessica Johns, Joanna Lilly, and Shana Lambert. We will begin our panel with a reading by each of the authors, followed by a discussion and then an opportunity for audience members to ask questions of our panelists. So I would like to introduce Jenna Butler. Jenna Butler is the author of the poetry collections Seldom Seen Road, Wells, and Aphelion, an award-winning collection of ecological essays, a profession of hope farming on the edge of the Grizzly Trail, and the travelogue Magnetic North Sea Voyage to Svalbard. She's a professor of creative writing and environmental writing at Red Deer College and lives on an off-grid farm in Alberta's North Country. We as readers get an intimate glimpse at this in her new work, Reverie, A Year of Bees, a beautiful collection of essays about beekeeping, climate grief, and trauma recovery. She takes the reader through seasons in her home and shares with us her deep connection to the land, its native and introduced species, and how tied our individual actions are to the greater world around us. Please welcome the first writer in our panel, Jenna Butler. Marina, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you to the Victoria Festival of Authors. Um, I'm grateful to be here tonight from the northern edge of Treaty 6, the traditional territories of the Cree, the Dene, the Soto, the Nitsitapi, the Métis, and the Nakota Sioux um, from my off-grid organic farm up here. I'm going to be sharing an excerpt from Reverie, A Year of Bees. Uh, this is the chapter, Tell It to the Bees. I've been thinking a lot about climate grief lately. It's an old beekeeper's adage that I've heard from numerous friends over the years. When someone in the house dies, you must go out to the bee yard and explain to your loved one, explain why your loved one won't be coming around anymore. When things in your life shift seismically in this way, you must always tell the bees. Who do you tell then when the bees themselves are dying? In 2018, climate grief became a recognized term increasingly used to describe the loss of hope and the feelings of helplessness experienced by many in connection with human-created climate change. I experienced a prolonged period of this too before learning the term for it, a period that lasted almost three years. 
And at the heart of my despair was the same sentiment that underpinned American conservationist Aldo Leopold's words, I'm glad I will not be young in a future without wilderness. My generation will likely be the last one to have a chance at dying before deaths begin to be more directly correlated to climate change than to old age or infirmity. A world reconfigured by global warming is the one my daughters would have inherited had they lived. It is the world my students will inherit and my little nephew. It is not a world I can forgive myself for leaving to them. It's this thought that has galvanized me to begin wading through my climate grief. Too often grief and guilt on that scale leads to a sort of stunned inaction. And the longer you and I sit idle, the more likely it is that our loved ones will inherit a planet that looks rather more like a punishment than a gift. I can't help but think of Senator Murray Sinclair's words to a gathered audience of several hundred students, faculty, and community members at Red Deer College back in 2016. He said that guilt stops us from moving forward, from changing for the better. Shame, though, that's a different story. Shame makes us want to actively repair what we've done, to make things right. I can't stop the forest fires in the boreal, but I can plant diverse stands of native trees here on the farm, including large clumps of aspens that wildfire scientists and backwood firefighters know as asbestos forests for their ability to act as living fire breaks. I can't stop the summer deluges that have become the new norm in our county, but I can study how to enrich the soil with cover crops and no-till methods to improve its permeability to rain. And I can't stop the rusty patch bumblebee from disappearing from the rest of its range, but I can observe, catalog, and plant for the wild bees here on the farm in a much more intentional way. I can sit with my grief and act on my shame in the most mindful ways in which I am able. There are no perfect solutions. Even to hint at such comes across as being glib, but I will write letters like never before to my members of parliament and my premier, to a political party currently in power in my province that I feel little affinity for, and that has shown itself to have no respect for the land under its care. I will commit to informing myself as much as possible about what's happening in the world around me when it comes to the actions of large corporations and high polluting industries, because I fervently believe that individuals do need to make mindful personal changes but big industries must be called to account for their impact on this world. And I will tell the bees, not just of my fears and of the great losses being sustained around the globe, but of my deep and abiding ache for the planet that the coming generations will inherit. I'll tell the bees that my grief at the end of the day looks an awful lot like love. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenna. Um, I would like to introduce our second writer um, on our panel this evening. Jessica Johns is a Nihiho English Irish auntie and member of Sucker Creek First Nation in Treaty 8 territory in Northern Alberta. She's the managing editor for Room Magazine and a co-organizer of the Indigenous Brilliance Reading Series. Her story, The Bull of Cromdale, was nominated for a 2019 Magazine Award. Her short story, Bad Cree, won silver at the 2020 National Magazine Awards and is long listed for the 2020 Writers' Trust Journey Prize. Her de debut poetry chapbook, How Not to Spill, published by Aralia's Ghost Press, co-won the 2019 BP Nickel Chapbook Award, and we have the privilege of hearing her read from this collection tonight. I would like to welcome Jessica Johns. Thank you so much, Farina, for that wonderful introduction. Um, yes, I, I will be reading um, a poem from this uh, collection um, that you see there before you, How Not to Spill. This particular poem that I'm reading, um, just to give a little bit of context, um, is um, and in, in context to the panel discussion tonight, um, I wrote while I was um, at a like a writer's camp um, on Main Island a couple years ago. Um, and I wrote it with deep consideration at the time and perpetually um, about what it means for me 
um, as a Nehiao uh, Cree person uh, from Treaty 8 territory who is not living in my territory, um, who is living on unceded territories of the Musqueam and Squamish and tsleil people. Um, so the protocol for me to be here, to be taking constantly um, what reciprocity means in my own life and with, with the land and um, original stewards. And um, it's, uh, it's essentially, it, it's also a conversation that I hope is, is still sort of um, ongoing with the, uh, the current and, and ongoing uh, land back movement um, which is to rightfully return lands, um, colonized lands, uh, particularly in so-called Canada to indigenous peoples. And this poem is called, Will the Water Hear Me If I Call Them in Cree? If the only thing blood remembers is fear, how do we travel outside ourselves? How do we snuff out the heat and build ourselves up again with rocks and other grandmothers who only wanted to give us memories of living. Day one, what to do instead of being in water. Pick blackberries. Know there is a wrong way to do almost everything. Learn again. Complain about the hills, but remember why you're here. Don't eat all the blackberries at once. Try to quantify vulnerability, rate yours from one to 10, and ask yourself why you always think of intimacy first. Give some of the blackberries away. Remember that feeding someone is sometimes the best thing you can do. Remember that the blackberries are invasive like you. Walk along a road you've never been on before. Make sure to notice every rock you walk over. Don't pray if you don't want to. Figure out the direction where you're going with where Pisum is in the sky. If you're bad with direction and don't like Pisum all that much, it's okay. There are more than four ways to be in the world and Pisum is a killer. Kiss someone you love with your stained mouth so that you leave them with a dark O. Proof that you've been somewhere, done something, that you can leave a trace of yourself without hurting. Two, throw yourself into the drawbridge of the future, Clarice Lispector. Go into the water up to your thighs. Put your hands through them, the love, not the water. Get to the heat of it, the carved out space in your body. How do you describe something you can't see except by naming things that can never measure up? How do you describe a black hole without first describing a lack? Maybe by describing the container or boundary except that love is without boundaries, so here we are. Day three, when you wade in up to your stomach, here is what you notice. One, light is different in your body. Light is different in water, and so is your body. Two, a bay is the most gentle body of water and is gentle with you too. Three, rocks will change in the seconds between the ocean floor and where they rest in your hand. Four, sometimes gentleness isn't what you need and it's okay to not be scared of that. Five, if you are scared, ask yourself if you were an animal, which animal would you be? Six, ask yourself if you are not already your animal or if what you lack makes you dream it. Seven, wonder if you dream differently underwater. Eight, face the open ocean, put your back to the land. Nine, that is not a metaphor. Don't turn your back on the land. 10, remember that the tide will move even if you refuse to. 11, braid seaweed with strands of your hair. 12, hope that doing this will make you seem a part of it. 13, 
shake hands with the water when you leave them. Day four, Kichimaki. Kichimaki sounds almost like I love you. Whisper it to the water even if they can't hear you. What does it mean for your body to be here? Your pockets spill with all the rocks and cuts you've found. Fall in love with water up to your neck. This love is specific, like the million ways of saying water in Cree. Can you even love right on stolen land? How do you flirt with a water that doesn't want you? Put your head under, under the water, not the love. Take it into your mouth and breathe out the shock. Will your future ancestors remember the pressure of ocean against their eardrums? How waves push and pull cedar branches? Will they remember how to be here? Will they leave their hair with yours? Will they spill rocks for you too? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was so beautiful. Lovely. Um, our next panelist is Shana Lambert. Um, she's the author of the novel Radiance and two books of stories, Oh My Darling and The Falling Woman, all of which were Globe and Mail Best Books of the Year. Her fiction has been nominated for the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize, the Evergreen Award, the Danuta Glean Award, and the Frank O'Connor Award for the short story. Her most recent novel is Petra, inspired by the activist and Green Party founder, Petra Kelly, who changed history and transformed environmental politics, only to find herself caught up in a triangle of love, jealousy, and murder. In Petra, we are taken to 1980s Germany at the height of the Cold War, where Kelly inspires hundreds of thousands of, to take to the streets to pro protest the placement of nuclear missiles on West German soil, including a NATO general named Emil Gerhardt. I'd like to welcome Shana Lambert. Thank you so much, Verena, and thank you to the other panelists, to Jenna, Jessica, and Joanna. Um, those were really beautiful readings. Just they went right into my heart. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the um, Victoria Festival of Authors for having me. It's such a treat. Um, with my last book, I got to come to Victoria and be part of the festival. And uh, I love your festival. It feels like it's got a very special beat to it. And um, I really appreciate being part of it with this panel. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for Rena for that beautiful introduction. And um, I'm going to read a little bit from Petra now. Um, as Verena explained, um, Petra Kelly, incredible charismatic woman, gets involved with a NATO, this is you know, the story from which I took my fictional story, um, gets involved with a NATO general. So we've got the, the peace activist and the general. And um, uh, this little piece I'm reading though is, is the narrator is a third person in this love triangle, Manfred Schwartz. And uh, I think of him as my Birkenstock wearing bearded alter ego and he tells the story he's in, in love with Petra and he's comparing in this short section chapter two he's comparing um, his politics with Petra's she's part German part American and so she does politics in the 80s differently strangers from another time this was West Germany 1980 in other words, you couldn't throw a stone on any university campus without hitting students who felt like they were carrying the ghost of Auschwitz on their backs. And the silence of our parents' generation up on our backs alongside the ghosts. They handed us their abominations without a word in homes soaked with the good smells of apple pie cooling on the windowsills, happy times in front of the fire. They just forgot to mention the pile of bones the whitened corpses buried in the backyard behind the trees. And we, detectives and prosecutors, had to dig them up for ourselves. What's this daddy holding up a collarbone, a breastbone? I found it behind the shed, a metaphor, but it felt like this just under the skin of our lives. At the Free University in Berlin in the late 60s, my friends and I had spent hours in mental agony 
Who were these people, our parents? We knew them intimately and yet we feared them and we distrusted ourselves because we were their offspring. But for Petra Kelly, it was different. She'd moved to the States when she was 12 after her mother married Commander Kelly, a US soldier, and stayed there until her mid twenties. This long sojourn away protected her from the self-disgust. She was from the land of Coca-Cola, had campaigned for Robert Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey, and had marched on Washington for civil rights. These things made her clean, made her attractive to our movement. She didn't have a Marxist bone in her body, and the politics of the 68ers, the ardent politicized students of Germany with our fury at the duplicity of our parents, was quite foreign to her. We're all interconnected. This was what she loved to say, loved to think. And she would quote from Gregory Bateson, what pattern connects the crab to the lobster and the orchid to the primrose and all four of them to me. As for the use of force, she opposed it utterly because, and I can really hear her speaking, we all have a core of goodness in us. This is what she thought. Even the most unhallowed criminals, even the man who sits in the pit of the nuclear missile with his finger flexed on the button, my Marxist self would take umbrage at her belief in human goodness. But him, Petra would say, well, he's just a child following orders. And what about the man who gives the orders, I would ask her, and the man who gives the orders to the man who gives the orders. There they were, all lined up like the chefs on my apron, one inside the other. And yes, according to Petra, they were all interconnected and all redeemable. The only real evil in this world came from reducing a person to the status of evil. That was what Petra Kelly thought. A memory. Petra shared this with me after we rode my motorcycle to Gunsburg together to see the place where she'd grown up. Later in bed, she told me the story. She was five years old, crossing a barley field, brushing the palms of her hands against the feathery heads. Her father walked beside her, tall, brown-eyed. He kept warning her to watch for snakes. Then, for some reason she couldn't recall, he began to tell her about how one day the sun would burn out. He was probably the sort of man who enjoyed his bits of knowledge, but Petra was horrified. She absolutely couldn't believe it. Such absence of light, such monstrous blackness. She ran from him and hid behind a millstone beside the Danube. I was sobbing and sobbing, but I also kept thinking, will he find me? Will he know how to find me? I suppose I had doubts even then about his commitment. Anyway, I didn't move an inch. And as I sat there, I began to make an elaborate plan. I would save the sun with a large lasso or some such thing, a rope and a pulley. It would be up to me. And did he find you, I asked, down by the river? She smiled. Yeah, he did. But not long after he was gone for good, disappearing one night early morning, a vagabond father running for the train, that was how she pictured him, with a kerchief sack tied to a stick like the hobos in American comic strips. Sometimes I really do believe he left me a note. She turned to me in the half dark. I can imagine what it said. I'm leaving her, my mother that is, but I'm not leaving you. Maybe he was just going for a little while. Maybe he wanted to make good. Isn't that what people do? They strike off because they can't bear to be poor, to be nothing. They just want to return to their loved ones, their little girls with gold in their pockets. I think he meant to do that for me, but then something terrible happened. I waited and she said, I used to imagine he got struck by lightning. I know, an unlikely scenario. Poor Petra, I murmured. She had her head on my arm. I leaned over and kissed her hair. And stopping the sun from burning out, did this continue to be your job? From the earliest age, yes. She met my eyes and I could see the child inside her, ardent and fierce, already committed to her impossible task. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shana. Um, what a lovely introduction to Petra Kelly. And yeah. hopefully it's sparked some interest and piqued people's uh, intrigue as to who this person is that we get to meet in your novel. Thank you. Um, our 
fourth panelist uh, is the author Joanna Lilly. She's an award-winning poet living in Whitehorse in the Yukon. Born in the UK, Joanna has always been drawn north, crossing the Arctic Circle twice before settling in the Yukon. Her work has appeared in numerous literary journals, including the Malahat Review and Grain. Endlings is her third collection of poetry and her fifth book. Endlings was published by Turnstone Press in March of this year. In this collection of poetry, Joanna connects us to just some of the species that no longer exist, often by our own doing. These poems become poignant reminders of just how precarious a species existence is on our planet. Please welcome Joanna Lilly. Thank you so much, Farina. It's really wonderful to be part of this amazing, uh, amazingly important discussion, I think. So I'm going to read um, a couple of poems. And as you mentioned, um, my poetry book, Endlings, it's about uh, extinct species. But I'm going to read a couple of poems that are on the broader theme of extinction itself and, and where humans fit within that, which I thought would be fitting for this discussion. And also before I get going, I just want to say that I am very grateful to be here in Whitehorse on the traditional territories of the Tahan Quachin Council and the Kwanindun First Nation. So this first poem is called Confession. I've always known what I wasn't doing. There was no shock of realization. I've always had the knack of alibi, of being nowhere near the moral center, of walking past what I committed and pretending I didn't see. It might be those flies, the wings I ripped off as they skittered up the window, blaming Tracy who started it, though that was no excuse, nor was being six. I already knew what cruelty was and torture. I wish someone had slapped me. I'm penned inside eternal self-indulgence, a constant busyness with me. I'm the antonym to intellect, an aberration who will die out and end this hedonistic lineage. Some extinctions are unremarkable. Some are even opportunity, no loss at all. And the second poem I'm going to read, it's called Northwest Passage, and it's inspired by um, really all my life. Um, I was born in the south of England, um, all my life wanting to go north, always having this urge. And I know it's a very common urge, um, particularly perhaps among Europeans. And I, I kind of worry about that and its connection to colonialism and here I am coming to Canada. I've been here for 14 years, so I'm almost like a neo-colonialist in a sense. So this is called Northwest Passage. The sketch in me is the sea growing, the drifting ice split by ships. We're the witnesses of the polar opening in half a lifetime. I draw a line over Baffin under banks without lifting the lead from the paper from the Labrador to the Beaufort Sea. The stories I've read about Franklin, they'll find the other ship soon. We live at the most important time, we always do. So much sex, so many babies, we're panicking, over planting. There's no such thing as a weed, although I see the point of letting sunlight through to the undergrowth. All the paintings, sculptures, ridges, railways, towers, all the plastic, chemistry, car and computer minerals, all our prosthetic limbs and eyes will press into a narrow layer, dense with difficult fossils. The quickest mass extinction, Triassic Jurassic, took 10,000 years. We like breaking records. I like to sit with my back to the window, sipping tea, the door left open for the cat and air. Over the fence, spruces, pines for miles, a grid of seismic lines of Aboriginal paths and rusting cars. A few hundred people between here and the Arctic Ocean. The water will flood through my door and down the street to the Alaska Highway. My wooden house will float as I dreamed it would 
and I will be inside the sea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joanna. I'm really looking forward to our panel um, discussion here. And um, the last lines in that poem, just the feeling and the image of drifting away on the ocean. Um, yeah, we're, we're the, uh, the title of the panel, um, Writing in the Time of Slow Disaster, um, I felt um, would all of your works kind of speak to the land, um, to our existence within it, our exploitation of it, um, hope tied into that as what we can do as writers, as creatives, um, just as citizens in the world. Um, so we have this ever looming and now perhaps faster or larger looming disaster, um, climatic disaster, of course. Um, we are in a Zoom panel um, with this, you know, pandemic that we have that's sort of brought more things to the forefront, I think. Um, but I'd like to ask a question, like, initially to all of you, um, and maybe we'll start with um, Joanna. In what inspired you to write? Is there an origin story or was there a specific moment that um, led you to this, like, that this particular um, book or um, essays or collection of poet poetry? Yeah, thank you. So it's a, a good question, and I've, I've something I've sort of thought about. Um, so the whole book is is about extinct species. You know, the majority of the poems I focus on individual species uh, that are no longer with us, and um, I had the idea for the book um, in one of those moments, those flashes, um, and just knew that that was what I wanted to do. And that was why that was about five years before it was published. And uh, it was at Sage Hill when I was at a writing retreat, uh, working on a different project. Um, so in a sense, that's when when it came but to me. But it's it's also been something that felt like I had always it, it was always coming to me as something I, I should write. I mean, even as a child, I, I've always um, cared about animals really deeply and got very upset about them and worried about seeing roadkill and, you know, the cruelty um, that we impose on animals for food production, all those things. So I've kind of had that all my life. I can't remember a time when I didn't care very deeply about animals. So, um, as time went by, as I was growing up, that became a connection to the environment more broadly around me. And of course, the environmental movement, which has been going on, of course, for many decades and beyond that. And uh, it's uh, this, what we're seeing now feels like a culmination of that. Yeah, so a kind of a, a slow growing, I think, of something. And I, and I feel I need to keep writing on this theme as well. So I felt very sad when I fin sort of finished the manuscript um, that I wouldn't be connecting with these species anymore. So I think I still have to carry on. Yeah, I would, I mean, as heartbreaking as some of those poems <laughs> were to read, um, I would, I would love to read more. Um, mm -hmm. And perhaps in the discussions with Jenna, there's some bees that uh, will pique your interest. Yes, I was thinking that earlier. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, maybe we can move to Jenna then. Is there a, an origin or a point of um, beginning for this, this year you take us through? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm out on this off-grid organic farm and we've only been here for 15 years. Um, we are on the land of people who have been stewarding this place a lot longer than we have. But even in those 15 years, I've been watching very carefully and just kind of taking notes as we do as writers um, about what's coming and going, what changes are happening, particularly in the boreal forest. We're at the very southern skirt of the boreal forest. So just watching what's happening in terms of wildfires and in terms of songbird species and particularly the bees. 
what's been happening with the wild bee populations. Originally, I started Reverie thinking about honeybees and the problems and the benefits of, you know, the Save the Bees movement. Um, and over time, the whole book shifted towards what's already here on the land and oh. the wild bees themselves and starting to see the place as a unified whole with a lot of interactions. And that's really where the book came from, just starting to want to delve into 15 years of observations and kind of dialoguing with place. Thank you. Um, Jessica, would you like to share your um, inspiration for the, the book, the chat book? Um, sure. I, I don't know if I had a necessarily, um, I wrote a lot of the poems that are in this chat book were written um, sort of individually without um, conceptually, um, without it in mind that I was going to be putting them into book form together. So I certainly, um, I didn't have that in mind um, from the beginning. However, um, when I was putting the manuscript together, it was very, very clear that I write about particular themes pretty consistently, which are, um, I write about my family a lot, um, in their mind a little too much. <laughs> uh, but I, they all had, had that, um, all, all the poems, I, I talk about my family, whether that's blood or, um, you know, just uh, my like kinship relations um, and uh, love and just relationships are a really big aspect of um, all the work I would say that's in this particular chat book and um, that extends to my relationship to the land um, and specifically the land I grew up on in my traditional territory um, and I think our relationship as people to the lands that we occupy whether there are territories or not um, they're inextricable, inextricable, wow, can't say that word. We can't take them apart. <laughs> um, we can't separate them um, from our relationships with any, anything else, human or non-human, so. Maybe that's a great segue to Shana, um, as, as you mentioned in your reading, the interconnectivity of everything that was Petra Kelly's, um, I mean, in her heart, what mm -hmm. she thought most. Um, would you like to describe your, um, yeah, what, what got you thinking about her and writing? My, my origin moment? Yeah, I'd love to. I also wanted to say that just hearing sort of to our theme for a second, this as I hear each of you read, I get this sense of, yes, the grief. And um, I think that when we pass grief back and forth in this way, something happens that is kind of releasing. So hearing about the bees, seeing the house become float out to the water. Do you know what I mean? If there's this, something lightens through that depth. So I just wanted to share that feeling. Um, but with Petra Kelly, I met her. She came to Vancouver in 1986 when I was an organizer for the Big Walks for Peace that we used to have out here. And it was a city-wide peace festival. And she came and she basically just knocked my socks off with her charisma. And she was fascinating. She was sexy. She was very different from we had a, a whole pile of actually really famous peace people that we brought because it was a city-initiated peace festival. Um, and so we had some money and um, we had John Kenneth Galbraith and Stephen Lewis and a couple of Nobel Prize winners, but she was the one who was just so dynamic. And everywhere she went and she was young and she was, you know, dressed differently, was really, you know, fun. But everywhere she went, she was dogged by this general who was 20 years older than her. He was a NATO general, a German general. And um, at one point, they were leaving the Orpheum Theater together and I was chatting with her because that's where she'd done her big um, you know, um, speech. And um, he noticed it was raining and he went back and he got an umbrella 
and then opened it for her and took all her bags and then led her across the street. And it was, I think that was the moment for me where I went, wow, this is, you know, this is not what you expect from an iconic peace activist, feminist in the 80s. You know, we, we push open our own doors and carry our own umbrellas. But it was years later that I became a writer and, and then um, I thought about that moment. I thought about the intricacies of that, you know, the oddness of it. And I think that was the seed that started me on the book. Thank you. Um, love, amazing that you would have had the chance to meet her. Um, oh, it was. Yeah, it was really, it was really interesting. I, I mean, I don't think I would have written the book if I hadn't, possibly wouldn't have written the book if I hadn't met her. But it was nice to know that I had that touchstone of actually having hung out with her a little bit. And yeah, I think that made a difference. I think that that's what twigged me. And then years later, I found out that she was, that she had died. And I won't go into what happened, but um, the shock of that as well. Yeah. Um, why did you choose Manfred as a narrator? Was there? Well, I think that Manfred, um, why did I choose Manfred? Uh, he grew on me. You know, I was this, when I first had the idea to write this book, uh, it was going to be a play and he was my narrator. And then when it morphed and it sort of went back and forth, being a play, being a, a novel, being a play, being a novel. And, um, but when it would go back into being a novel, uh, Manfred would come along. And I didn't really know why, you know, you do these things when you're writing, you do them so slowly sometimes that you just kind of lose track of why you're doing them. But things become really essential to you. You can't give them up. And um, Manfred became that for me. And then ultimately, when I finally got to the end of the book and it was working out the way I wanted it to, I realized, oh, right, he's a foil for the entire story of Petra. His choices are like little microcosmic moments that you can compare with how she's decided to live, you know? And so in, an, in the end, his story becomes as important as hers. So I think that's why I didn't know it at the time, but I had a good reason. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess I, I'm also intrigued in the, the amount of research that has gone into some of your work. Um, Joanna has uh, the end notes in, in um, endlings are quite substantial and like a good starting point for any researcher looking to find out more information about all the lovely species that we meet um, in such a poignant way. Um, was there a, an am amount of research or how is your process of researching um, these animals and the various species that you um, met or we meet? Yes, um, it, it was sort of a process as maybe a, <laughs> a not, not quite the right word. I was always wanting to be very linear, but um, I don't seem to be able to work that way. So um, I really... Um, I found the animals in very different ways. So I, I had some books about extinct animals and I bought new books about extinct animals and I had some books by artists who had drawn extinct animals. And then I was very lucky enough to get funding um, from the government of Yukon here to go off to some natural history museums in the days when we could do that. And so that was a, a huge help to see fossils and sort of meet, meet the animals as it were um in obviously very sad and perhaps stale ways but it really helped me um and really anywhere i went what during the period i was researching them i would go to the natural history museum and find and you know try and connect with the animals that were there um i also was very keen to um not just write about animals that humans have made extinct i wanted to go back beyond that but beyond the time when we came along to kind of connect with species who existed a long time before we did and that was really magical somehow and it just seemed an important part of it so about half of the poems are actually about those species you know over the over the millennia and the other five mass extinctions before we came along and created the sixth one um, so I would just read as much as I could or, and go and see them, take photographs, um, and then kind of find 
the emotional connection, the story, the, the little hook, I suppose. I, I tend to be quite a narrative poet. I like little stories, maybe because I always started off writing fiction before I <laughs> felt brave enough to start writing poetry. Um, and that would come along in different ways. I mean, there's, there's videos of some species like the Heath Hen, sort of scratchy videos, black and white of the very last Heath Hen in New England. And that was, it's, I still watch it sometimes. It's just heartbreaking and incredible to, to see that. So that poem is inspired very much by that video. Yeah. And I'm not a scientist, so I did have to do a lot of research. I'm, I have no foundation, um, you know, so yeah, I had to learn a lot of words, but then make sure they didn't end up in the poems because that, that doesn't, that kind of means it's not really a poem anymore. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, that's wonderful to hear um, because it does, um, the poems all do allude to these truths that are um, in their collection, really hard to, to um, believe or, I mean, we have to believe them. Yeah. It, it is the truth. Um, these are all extinct animals and um, the interwoven like uh, um, prehistoric extinctions or, or ones that we had no real hand in as, as humans. Um, they, they ground the work, but it still brings it right back to like, it's us. And then we're reading about them and we're feeling that. And then the speed with which the, the other species that are coming or falling extinct, becoming extinct, um, mm -hmm. hits that home. Um, yeah. Uh, anyways, I wanted to thank you for that. Um, thank you. Jessica, um, you mentioned, uh, about, um, you mentioned writing about your family, um, and that maybe you write about them too much. Um, my, my question to you, um, right now, I guess, initially is how do you choose how much to reveal? Um, the, the how not to spill, um, title is, are you spilling like secrets? I, I read it that way sort of too, a little bit, because there's a lot of, um, you share a lot of intimate stories about your family. Um, how do you choose what to reveal? And we're very privileged to hear, um, some of those, um, thoughts and, and, um, experiences that you have. Um, I mean, I, I certainly was, I mean, it was kind of a half joke that my family is sick of it. Um, um, I don't, I think, yeah, there are some intimate stories in there. Um, but with how I decide what I'm sharing really, I mean, it depends, um, story to story, it depends kind of day to day because, um, I don't, I, I don't want to do a couple of things. I, I'm, I'm only here to share my own truth, not the, um, truth of somebody from my family who have experienced, um, some, you know, pretty horrific things. Uh, at the hands of, you know, um, systemic colonial systems. Um, and they're not my stories to share, but I certainly can share my own of, um, and so my line is really, you know, what, what I feel comfortable with. Um, and for the most part, they're not things that um, are incredibly, uh, you know, they're not things that are like exposing them to anything terrible or, or anything like that. It's truly just my feelings about stuff. <laughs> the whole book is just my feelings. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's really, it's, it was a difficult, it was though, that being said, a difficult process in 
in sharing some things because, um, you know, it's a very vulnerable thing to, to share, um, particularly, you know, family situations. But um, yeah, there were things that I obviously wanted to get out and things that, you know, I felt important um, to sort of um, archive by way of this chat book. And it is, um, you know, every single kind of poem, I think, is a negotiation with that. I want to thank you for your generosity with the poems. Um, I also, we have a question um, for you from an audience member. Um, in You wrote, no, there's a wrong way to do almost anything. What kinds of things were you thinking about when you wrote that? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, okay, so I guess at the time I was writing that particular poem, um, this was also around the same time where I was doing a lot of community um, organizing and work. So that's when the Indigenous Brilliant series um, sort of first, that was around the time that it was just beginning. Um, and, you know, I had, um, I was, I was really involved in literary community, but like mostly just really, um, and I had just moved here a couple, like a year prior. So I was still, um, as I said, like there was this continuous process of, um, trying to figure out, um, as uh, a Cree person who, you know, is not from these territories, um, a continuous process of trying to figure out my, you know, relationship to like my cousins here, like my, you know, um, um, the communities here and like how I was going to be here in a good way. And that necessitated, <laughs> that involved making a lot of mistakes. Um, so I don't actually think that I had any when I wrote that line, I don't know if I had any specific things um, in mind that I had done, but it was um, essentially, um, I was, you know, being in community and community organizing means um, making mistakes and it means sometimes doing things wrong. And um, particularly while we're in, um, we've been since, birth essentially um sort of a player in um in a society that um has i've had to unlearn a lot you have to unlearn a lot of of again these like systemic um things that were kind of um thrown into uh, our entire lives and so in that process of unlearning um and learning again better ways to be means making mistakes and um, and and everything you do because you can make a particular mistake in one way in one situation and you can be in a very similar one but it's still a completely new situation because um, that's that's how relationships are they're different and they're complex and so um, there's going to be another way to make a mistake in that one too and so I think I was just really preoccupied with um, that as a general concept and um, I didn't have specific things in mind, but I for sure, you know, there were a lot of things I was doing wrong. Um, and it was just about um, refocusing intentionally on those relationships and um, again, that process of unlearning and then um, learning how to move forward again with, um, yeah, moving forward in a good way. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, Jenna, um, Reverie is so much about the practicalities of beekeeping um, and small scale farming in an educational sense, yet it's also a deeply personal journey of healing um, interwoven throughout the practicalities of the day to day existence on this small farm. Um, off-grid farm. Um, when the personal abuse trauma um, that you endured in your youth 
um, was revealed later in the book. Um, I've, I felt that there was, initially, I, I felt the climate grief um, that you were kind of resolving or dealing with through your writing and through the keeping of the bees. But then it was revealed that there's this personal um, healing journey that the whole process of um, engaging in this beekeeping um, practice is helping you with. Um, do you want to speak to to that? Well, I mean, only if you like. Um, but how much do you share? Like, where is that? It's, I guess, similar to asking Jessica, writing about a family, her family, and, and sharing these deeply personal moments. Um, mm -hmm. Where, how do you decide how much to share? Or what is your process there? Originally, my process wasn't to talk about what had happened to me at all, even though it was one of the things that was underpinning the book. Um, it was partly out of that sense of um, responsibility to the people reading it whether that's family or someone picking up the book and saying, oh, I expected beekeeping, and then there's this other narrative. Um, but a lot of it tied in, kind of tangled up with the climate grief that I, I was having a really hard time working my way through was also the personal grief. Like, how do you work your way through trauma? Mm -hmm. And I was very grateful to have uh, a wonderful editor and publisher, Noelle Allen, and she gave me time and space to sit with both of them. And she gave me a lot of um, room to figure out not just how to articulate the climate grief but also she had said you might want to interrogate you know you might want to bring in the personal narrative and I really had to wrap my head around that it was a partly a permission granting for myself to know that that was out in the world and and to come to some sort of peace with the people that it would impact and to talk first to the people that it would impact so it just didn't blindside anybody um, but also without giving, you know, without throwing too much onto the audience, um, the person that hurt me passed away partway through the writing of the book. And that gave me a whole lot of time to just go inside and say, now I'm the only person who's holding these stories. While I'm figuring out the narrative for the book, I'm the only person who's holding these stories of what happened. I can choose how I want to walk with them now. And so while I was writing the book and I was looking at coming to like an active sense of hope moving forward with some kind of direction into the future with the bees, with climate, um, with the farm, I was also finding my way forward with the stories that I was carrying myself and kind of divesting myself of things and saying, it happened, I can't change it. Um, but this is how I choose to walk in the world now. And yeah, trauma brought me to beekeeping because it brought me to something that I thought I was going to be terrified by. And then I found a lot of solace in. So everything kind of dovetailed as I went along. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I guess m moving into our sort of um, heavier topic of climate grief and I did, you mentioned hope. Um, in in your just now in your response um and having a hope but being uh I, I read an interview that you did where you made a very poignant asked a very poignant question about having um how do you find hope when your sense of agency is so small and i think a lot of us are feeling that in the world these days um and as writers or creatives, we do with that. We tell stories, um, we make images, we make music. Um, the pandemic lockdown showed how much value there is in that, in the creative aspect of our society when everyone was turning to um, the musicians and the artists and the writers. and. Um, and it really brought relevance to that, of course, but then we're also making, um, you guys are all writing in this climate, in this time of grief. Um, there is hope. Is hope enough? Um, does someone want to respond first? Do you want to give a, is there, how, how do you battle with that as, as creatives? I, I could, I could take a, I could take a stab, but it's just a stab. Um, yeah, I was thinking about sort of the relationship of hope to being 
a creative person and how this all plays out. And, you know, I sometimes feel as though, um, like as a writer, I don't feel like I have any kind of agenda to give hope or to provide hope or to really do anything political. Um, but that if somebody does something that is that goes deep, you know, as we've heard tonight, it does touch you and then something happens. But that is so different from having an agenda, you know? And so I just, I guess I guess wanted to sort of talk a little, like bring that into the conversation that, um, that I don't think that anything rests on artists or writers except to speak as deeply as they can. And that when we do that, we kind of hit a kind of groundwater and then something comes up. Like I've, I've, I've felt it tonight when I hear your readings and, and, I, and I think that, that's, that that is a very important thing that happens. And then the other thing I wanted to mention was um, that a friend of mine, when, when our kids were little, she used to do this trick where she would um, get one of the kids to stand up and she would say, now I'm going to mess with your energy. And she'd go, whee, 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 and she'd cut the energy up. And then she would uh, try to, um, what would she do to them? She'd try to, I think, lift them. And they would be like way lighter. And then she'd let them settle again. And they would settle. And then once they had settled themselves down, their energy would be strong again. That would be harder to lift. And I feel like that's what's happened to us as a society. I think we've had our energy all cut. And we are, we are um, I, mean, I mean, I know things are terrible, but I feel like we're fractured. We're, we're cut. And there's a we reweaving that I think is going to happen as we come back into ourselves, you know? So I do feel that, but I don't think that as artists, we have to then take up the needle and start doing the weaving. I just think that, I just think that's going to happen. You know, I think that's going to happen as we come into who we, where we stand again after the shock. Um. Yeah, I can say something. Um, I think that, I don't think that there is hope without action. I, I think that um, it is a survival mechanism to feel hope um, because you, you want to get through. Um, and and um, and sort of waiting for what's going to happen next without tangible action, um, especially when it comes to the climate crisis and everything that's attached to that um, doesn't mean anything. So I, I truly, um, I think I've been seeing a, a disconnect between when people talk about the climate crisis um, and, and actions for climate justice and um, like a separation then with um, indigenous rights and um, indigenous sovereignty, when those things are, again, they're, they cannot be pulled apart. Um, I think any hope that there is for the world to be right again lies with the returning of lands to Indigenous peoples and um, which means um, the returning of, of proper relationships to, um, to, to our, our lands and um, communities and that benefits everybody in every possible way. Um, but as an artist, uh, I found personally that my, <laughs> I found, I didn't, I had a very hard time writing, um, particularly uh, when the pandemic first started. Um, I had a very difficult time finding uh, a point in doing that when so much is at stake and I think that 
yes, I, um, you know, I too was turning to um, books and I was turning to artists um, to, to listen to and to, um, you know, as, as my own ways of also like escaping um, into fiction and, and things like that. But I had a hard time creatively um, because of grief, because of um, just the, the state of the world and of my own communities. Um, and I'm still having a very hard time figuring out what my role as an artist is in this. Um, and I don't, I don't know, I would love to write about hope as much as possible and I would love to write that into stuff, but I don't, um, yeah, I don't, I don't see it as a sort of a, the, our job either, I guess, um, or, you know, which is kind of all that's, I don't want to bring this down. <laughs> it's pretty doom and gloom, but, you know, just the very honest truth for my own practice, it's a difficult thing to try and hold um, just the reality of everything and look to, because when I look to the future and when I write, I try and write into the future. I try and write for, I think about, um, I'm writing for my future ancestors. I'm writing for, you know, my, my nibblings, um, people that will come after me, my family that will come after me. And I, when I think about the kind of world I want to leave them, um, and I'm planning for a future that means doing something now. And so it, it, it is, um, it is very related, I think, um, artwork and sort of what we're leaving for the future. And it's an, it, again, it's sort of an ever present conversation or thing that I think about now is what do I want that to be? Um, yeah. I think I might add something in, Verena, if I could. Yeah, please. We still have time. I, that, that concept of hope is so, so tricky. And that sense that almost that if you don't see something unfolding, if you can't kind of wrap your head around it, it, it tends to tangle right around your feet and it just kind of takes you down. Um, and I really agree with what Jessica was saying, that kind of that, that, that concept of hope without, without action, particularly when it comes to climate grief. There's, it doesn't seem like there's a really tangible way forward, but sometimes I wonder whether even just the tiny actions that we can take for ourselves at a time like this, because so many of us are writing letters to politicians and so many of us are trying to support initiatives out there and showing up and sometimes with large initiatives, it seems like you're sending something out and you're not sure whether you're gonna hear anything back, whether institutions or big systems are gonna hear you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it just feels like those tiny things that you can do right, right in front of you right now to enact hope, to make a small change, to give yourself the tiniest sense of solace and find a small, small way forward just from one moment to the next. Um, you know, I find that when I'm outside, even just working with the bees or out in the garden or out in the forest, just kind of observing the wild bees and seeing how to support them from one year to the next and just trying to stay out of their way for the most part, <laughs> letting them do their thing. Um, just those tiny, tiny things give me a sense of momentary hope. It's just like getting your breath sometimes before you go back under the water and you're not sure what's coming at you and you're not, you're not certain how long it's gonna last, COVID all of this stuff that's coming at us right now, mm -hmm. but just kind of those little interstices. I don't know. I don't know whether it's my job as a writer either, but I feel like I'm taking those tiny little gasps for air and kind of a direction forward in my own life. And that can kind of pass across in my writing. I'm happy with it. That's so beautiful. You know, um, there's also something that, that I felt a lot when I was getting close to the end of Petra, which is, you know, they were working so hard, this group of activists in 83, 84, to stop the nuclear missiles. And when change happened, it happened, you know, 
uh, when the wall fall, fell in 89 and there were people dancing, you know, on the, on the Berlin Wall and then going at it with sledgehammers, it all happened so quickly. And I was really involved in the peace movement at the time. So I remember we were just struggling to catch up. And so I do think that sometimes, you know, on this question of hope, sometimes, yeah, we do the small things and then sometimes political will does fall into place and big shifts are possible. So I also believe that that could happen. I think the thing that's so damaging for us right now is that the political will is so fractured. But, you know, if we can get lined up, if we can get, you know, if we can get good policies, if we can get the serious, like Elizabeth May was saying on the television um, today, because they voted in a new Green Party leader, national leader, um, you know, she she was she was saying if we can take um, the climate change issues as seriously, the scientific you know um, arguments for them as seriously as we take the um, the arguments that are coming from the medical officers on the pandemic, if we listen to them and obey them, you know, if we could do that, if we could do that as a society, you know, we could see shift, we could see, and I think that would give us a lot of hope if we were functioning collectively as a society. And I don't, my personal feeling is that maybe we're really far off that, maybe we aren't. Sometimes change shocks you. You know, there were people who actually slept through the fall of the Berlin Wall because they were not expecting it, right? They stayed up and got drunk and forgot to check the news. And next thing you know, all their friends told them, oh, wow, we had an amazing weekend. You know, the Berlin Wall fell. And they were in Berlin and they just did like, they weren't, they weren't there, right? So, and, and so I think that that can happen. That could happen, you know, um, without being kind of pie in the sky about it. I do believe that, um, that, enormous huge cultural shifts and political shifts can can occur and i th and i'm hoping for that the um i mean the the sort of immediate lockdown that happened in the western i mean in sort of the western world come march where it was like we all sort of did work together almost as a global society and you know, planes stop flying and they're still not back to, to normal. We're doing these distance Zoom meetings and instead of going on our business trips. And so, I mean, maybe that the, the disaster of the COVID-19 pandemic and how that's rolled out and how privileged I've been to be in Victoria where we've, um, and in BC where we have uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry who, we all listen to, um, but we could, we can do it. It's not that it's an impossible task. Like we've been led to believe by industry and politicians, like it's not good for the economy to slow things down. The climate disaster is now looming. Like it's, it's unfolding faster, but the issue with these slow kind of moving issues is that, like Jenna said, they tangle you unless it's immediately unfolding around you. You're just kind of like, oh, well, okay, tomorrow, like I'll just get, get through my day to day. Um, there was a question from the audience, uh, in the audience, um, if any of you find solace in writing your, um, writing these stories and poems. And maybe that ties in a little bit to what we're doing as artists, as we keep working are we doing, I mean, we're, we're creative beings because that's what we do and we've chosen to do. Um, but do you find solace? Maybe we'll start with Joanna. Yes. Um, the, the short answer is yes, definitely. I, it feels like it's just something I, I have to do and that's, it's how I process life really. So I can't imagine not going through what we've all been going through in the last few months without having that. Um, when the pandemic was declared, um, I have a, a day job. I don't, amazingly, I don't live off the poetry. I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> um, so I was immediately seconded to work on the COVID communications with, you know, with working with the chief medical office. office. Um, so I, I had no time for writing um, at all. I was writing, but I was writing news releases and all those wonderful things. Um, 
so I found that so hard to, to suddenly lose my writing just at a time when I needed my writing. Um, so I just had a, I had my little notebook on the bedside table. So I would try and write a few words just before I went to sleep to kind of keep that connection. Um, so yes, I, it, it was such a relief to be able to reconnect as, as the weeks went by with, with that essential part of my life. So I, I can't imagine, yeah, not, not having it. And I, I feel that if we can all just keep connected with our writing, our art, our music, whatever it is, that that creates the hope. It's it's more of a, you know it's not something yeah we that we decide with an agenda. It's it's something that I think as as we've all been saying, kind of whether we're weaving together again or we're rising up, it it just feels vital. As and that's what gives me hope. I think if we can just keep being human beings through all this. Yeah. There's another question from um, uh, one of our lovely audience members. Um, if there's a poem um, that was the most difficult to write and or publish or a, perhaps a, a section of the novel or of your essays. Um, maybe Jenna, do you want to Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a, an essay in my book called How You Heal. And it alludes a little bit to what I talked about before, um, climate grief, but also personal trauma and moving through personal trauma. And that was absolutely, it was the hardest part to write. And it was really difficult to, um, to figure out how to let it out into the world. It's one, it's partly why it took so long to write. And why it comes later on in the book, I was figuring out where do I put this? Because if you put a trauma narrative in a collection of essays that's ostensibly about beekeeping or the climate or something, how do you do that without the entire thing going crash? So yeah, that was the hardest. Um, Jessica? Um, was, sorry, was it um, the most difficult yeah, was there one? Was there a a poem um, that was the most difficult, or most? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's one that I never read, um, and yeah, I yeah. Sometimes it's one of those ones where I'm like, I change my mind every day about whether or not I should have put it in there. But um, it's a it's a poem about my mom and. Um, uh, just a, an incident when I used to work at a bar, um, a, just a really racist incident that happened in front of me to her. And, um, you know, it's about inaction. It's about like not doing something when something like that happens and like the shame and, and sort of, um, you know, carried on from that. And I was actually similarly to Jenna, like worried about where to put this in, especially because trauma narratives, um, or you know anything to do with trauma, particularly from um, Black and Indigenous people or people of color, um, it can it can often to uh, white audiences and white readers can be a bit voyeuristic or like feel um, yeah just feel can feel icky sometimes that relationship and and that look into that and uh, especially when you can't control how somebody is going to spin that or read that or whatever. Um, so that was a difficult thing to put in, but I did for the, you know, cause I was talking about my own, my own shame and my own um, feelings around that. So I did ultimately think it was important, but it was certainly difficult to write. It was difficult to put in and placement of like when that should occur and you know where and why and stuff was was a uh, um again continuous sort of conversation is there a poem in your um collection joanna that um yeah i was thinking about that I mean, in a way, they were all hard to write and all easy to write because of the kind of the 
the magic of connecting with all the animals. There was one poem about the Beringian wolf that um, nearly didn't make it into the final version. And I was kind of just determined to hang on to it. And so I think just from a technical point of view, it just wasn't really working. It wasn't fitting with the theme. And I mean, it started off, it was about the wolf, but it was set in a cafe in Vancouver. And then I relocated it to a cafe in Whitehorse and it was all about eating disorders. And then, <laughs> and then I just changed it again because I really didn't want to lose it. And it sort of became more about my dog in the forest. And then finally I sort of found, I found what it was about and uh, it stayed in there. So I, I was quite pleased. So I don't know, usually I, I'm always really happy to take the advice of editors, but for some reason I, I couldn't let that one go. I just want, wanted the wolf to be in, in the collection somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It allows for a bit of insight into your creative process as well. Um, it's sort Shana, of stubbornness, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Shana, was there a, a part um, in Petrick that you found um, difficult to put in, or yes, um, I I had finished the book and. Um, when I gave it to my editor, um, she said, why now? Why now? And she didn't just mean why now for the book, but why is Manfred, because it's told from the point of, you know, Manfred's writing a memoir about his, um, his long love for Petra Kelly, who by this time has been dead, but for 25 years. And he's, and, and she said, why now? And um, then I sort of had to go through the whole book and figure out, why the now is speaking to the then and what is going on, you know, between those, between now and then. And so then that brought the whole thing up to staring in the face of the present situation. And those, you know, not many paragraphs, but, you know, of this time now talking back. And the reason why Manfred writes the book is very connected to climate change and to his own children and to his, his life. So that was, that was one piece. And then the other thing that she said was, um, there needs to be one final turn of the screw between Petra and the general. And so then, well, there'd been so many turns of the screw, but then I had to go back and I felt like I had to tighten the whole book. You know, I had to like look at each scene. I actually pulled them out of the book and treated them separately over the course of about six months. And I just kept tightening, tightening all the way along to try to get to the end. And in the end, something new did kind of happen. So that was yeah, I would say those were the two parts that were hardest to write. Thanks. It's a bit of the educator in me that's gleaning information or for <laughs> our audience to get into your process a little bit. Um, why now? I like that as a question too, because we have um, a new generation of climate activists and the youth movement and the um, Fridays for Future and and hanging the hope maybe on the children who, um, like the quote in your reading, Jenna, who won't live, like they're the, uh, who was it? Mm -hmm. um, they won't live, a, they won't die a death of natural like causes, it'll, um, or, they won't be, the, they're living in a future that right now, I mean, being like Greta Thunberg is 17 and she's not gonna live, I mean, she hopefully will live to be 80 or 90 or 100 in this beautiful future that we're gonna allow to have happen. Um, but that's not what the youth are looking at. And, and I, I like, um, I like how the novel refers to that, allows that to um, tie together at the end that way, um, Shana. Yeah, thank you. I It was so important for me, ultimately. I mean, and you asked me earlier, why was why does Manfred tell the story? I mean, I think it's because, you know, he does have children in the end, you know, and he is not just speaking to them, but they are speaking up through him you know, his beautiful activist daughter. I have a beautiful activist daughter. I have a beautiful artist activist daughter. And so I, I know what that feels like to be set on fire by somebody. And I think he feels that coming to him again, not just from Petra, but also from his daughter. 
And I think keeping in mind her um, need for interconnectivity, realizing the interconnectivity mm-hmm. of all of of all of the land, of us, the land, the creatures that inhabit it, the ones that have gone extinct already that still are, um, should have a place in it, despite their absence. That's really beautiful, Verena. You know, that's a beautiful thought. And yeah. I don't want to end this on like a huge doom and gloom. Like it's still the slow disaster. We've, we've kind of um, shared our grief. Uh, we have a few minutes left if there's more grief to share. If anyone has any other comments they'd like to, or questions they'd ask of each other. Um, there's not any pressing audience questions at the moment, but if, if one of you has a question for another panelist maybe. Well, I have one for Joanna. I'm, I w- I'm really interested. I mean, first of all, all of you, I just, your readings were so magical and I'm looking forward to buying all of your books. Mm-hmm. Um, Joanna, my question for you is, um, when you wrote into the animals that were long extinct, like beyond our cause, causation, was there some comfort in that? Yeah, I think there was actually, and it, it was never my intention to sort of have almost half the book about animals before we existed and about half you know since we existed that it wasn't uh, it wasn't a plan at all and it just evolved that way but I think it was actually yeah a comfort to to go far far back and and recognize that we're we're just another species and we're evolving and 99 percent of all animals that who that have ever existed on this earth have become extinct um, you know, mostly, of course, through ma- the previous mass extinction. So there's every chance that humans will be extinct as well, eventually. And that's, <laughs> I know we're talking about not ending on doom and gloom, but there's a, there is a comfort in that. You know, we, we're very, we're just another species. We're an animal and we, you know, we tend to talk about the animals as if we're not an animal. And I'm very keen to, you know, use the terminology, non-human animals. And I'm trying to talk about animals as they now not it you know things like that um yeah so so there was yeah just to look to look at the whole the whole period of of time of the life of the planet yeah yeah and i found out about all sorts of amazing animals that existed and yeah Mm -hmm. it was it was magical it sounds wonderful thanks was still muted. Um, <laughs> there is a audience question. Um, what tiny bit of good do you recommend for all of us to do out here in this world? Um, is there, I think Jenna alluded to that where she, the small things that we can do. Um, is there any um, specific that you would like to share? Um. I'd like to just share because we can see each other as panelists but I just wanted to yeah acknowledge the audience because it's just so lovely that you're there and that's I think something that we've connected and I know there's probably a lot of writers in the audience a lot of creative people environmentalists and it's just nice to feel that we are connecting in this conversation together and I think that in itself is, is, is powerful. Um, I think one thing that would be really um, a tiny bit of good for yourself. Um, I did this for myself today and it was, uh, and the last um, couple days that I received this issue um, that I recommend everyone else doing because it's, it's a really good thing you could do for yourself. And I think, um, probably, you know, your communities, is to get this issue of Briar Patch. It's the land pack issue. Um, it explains and talks a lot from Indigenous perspectives about the land back movement, 
and um, you know addresses things like there's a difference between indigenous um, returns, uh, land returns to indigenous people, to uh, the difference between that and ownership, which doesn't isn't a concept that um, exists for us. That's that's a colonized concept or a colonial concept, um, and other things um, like environmental for sure. Um, but again, um, not. Um, it's not something that can be separated from indigenous issues and and this issue is probably I, I think it should be taught in schools i it's one of the greatest issues of, of a magazine that i've read personally and um it's been the forefront in my mind and i feel like it's been a really great thing for me the past couple of days to read and and really sit with these things um so that's the one thing that I would suggest for people highly. Um, it's online, so um, all their content is, so highly recommend it. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, so we've come to the end of our panel discussion here. Um, we've reached 9.01. We've even gone over by a minute. Um, I wanted to thank you, Joanna, Jenna, Jessica, and Shana for a wonderful conversation and a wonderful evening here at the Victoria um, Festival of Authors. And um, yeah, I would just like to say good night to everyone and thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone to coming. Thank you very much for attending this panel and thank you especially to our moderator and authors, Verena Kemenertz, Jenna Butler, Jessica Johns, Joanna Lilly, and Shana Lambert. I also want to acknowledge Laura Trunke, the VFA 2020 producer, and thank her for her amazing work to bring the festival together in this challenging year. If you're interested in purchasing any of the books featured today, please support festival sponsor and VFA bookseller Munro's Books. You can find the books featured during the festival in store and online at munrobooks.com. There are many more events during the festival, so please visit our website, victoriafestivalofauthors.ca, to review the program. Our website also features Q's and A's with all the authors participating in VFA 2020, as well as a place to sign up for the newsletter. If you'd like to support the festival in another way, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter and encourage your friends to attend one of our upcoming events. You can also make a tax-deductible donation to Victoria Festival of Authors through our website, or on VFA's page at Canada Helps. Your donation helps to keep VFA an engaging, accessible, and sustainable festival. We hope we will see you at our next event, Between Worlds, Voice, Community, and Coming of Age, tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m. Pacific time. This event features authors Sheena Kamau, Zalika Reed Benta, and David A. Robertson, and is moderated by Robin Stevenson. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope we'll see you next time. <laughs>